Turn to James chapter 3. This is perhaps not a popular subject, but necessary. We're going to read all of chapter 3, so bear with us, beginning at verse number 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasted great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and have been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Can either vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Somebody say pure. Pure. Then peaceable. 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 Gentle. Gentle. And easy to be entreated. Easy to be entreated. Full of mercy and good fruits. Mercy and good fruits. Without partiality. Without partiality. And without hypocrisy. And without hypocrisy. Together. And the, and the fruit, fruit of, of righteousness, righteousness is sown in, in peace of them that, that make peace. peace. Amen. Amen. Father, I want to thank you right now for the word of God. I ask that you will amplify it and be glorified. And let me say only what you want said. I Thank you, for this is your show. This is your movement. And God, we are simply little conduits. So flow through this vessel according to your divine purpose and will. We are asking in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Well, we're going to talk a little about something that nobody really seemed to be concerned about. And that is to keeping a control on that little, small member that can do so much harm. It is something that we must learn as Christians if we are going to prosper in the way in which God intends for us to prosper. The tongue can cause many delays in our lives. The tongue can sabotage what God has in mind. We must be aware as Christians because 
uh, we are made more in the image and likeness of God because that twisted, distorted state that we were in when we fell, we've been restored back to God. And so there is a renewal process. And in that renewal is learning to keep a tight rein on the tongue. It is imperative. It is absolutely necessary as people of God. God, if God didn't keep a rein on his tongue, we would not be here. And God will not even speak everything that he's thinking. He began to teach me that years ago. I was saying something and I said something that I shouldn't have said and it got back to another person that I respected and boy was I feeling bad and so the Lord said to me he said so you see son even if I had thought that I wouldn't have said it God is a God of wisdom Wow, if you trust him, he will help you. He, if you trust him and obey him, he'll cause you to land in success and victory after victory. But you have to pay attention to it when he's talking to you and obey him. I've done it both ways. I've not paid full attention sometimes and suffered the consequences. And then there were times that I paid full attention and I got the blessings that he intended. So I'm not standing here telling you I've got it together. I'm standing and telling you that I'm the instrument that he chose. There's a difference, isn't that right? <laughs> Amen. So I'm, I'm, I'm qualified to speak because of that. All right. So now that's clear. So let's go to the word of God. James 3 said, my brethren. Be not many teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater or the stricter judgment. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Now, I, 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 you've heard me say this so many times. We grew up on the farm, and, and, and we had two mules. We had horses and all that stuff. The landlord did. So, but there was one mule that was very unruly. I mean, he was really unruly. And so the, the, the other tenant that was uh, dealing with him, if he got too unruly, he had the bit in his mouth and he would kind of seesaw snatch on this side and that side. And because the bit was in the Mule's mouth, he, 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 it was a place where he, he had to come back under because it would hurt him. But that was a control. That, the bitch was to keep him under control so he could do what the farmer needed done. And so it, the, the bitch was there, and it had two little rings, and the rope would hang, it would tie on both sides. And so wherever he wanted the mule or the horse to go, he would pull that. If he wanted to go to the left, he would pull the left string. If he wanted him to go to the right, he'd pull the right. So that animal knew to do it, and so he did it. James was talking about we put bits in the horse's mouth uh, that they may obey us, and we turn about the whole body. And then he said, the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce wind, pay attention to that, driven of fierce winds, winds are indicative of spirits. And the implication is this year, he says, that if we can control our speech when we are facing adversities, then we can control our whole being. Uh, I talked to somebody not too long ago, and God placed them on my heart, and I said, you okay, how's everything going, and they they said, I just got to tell the Lord, Lord, why are you doing this to me? Why are you letting this happen to me? I mean, they were going, I said, oh, okay, I got you. I've been there. I've been there. 
But God, we, we talked on last week about some of the things, what God is doing. Everybody remember that? He said endurance. He's working some endurance in our life. I ain't going there. But, but uh, the, 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 the passage here is dealing with the control of the tongue, which is very important. Uh, let me get my glasses out here. I want to make, be able to see. Mastery of the tongue is a sign of wisdom. When we master our tongue, our words, our speech, it is a sign of wisdom. Proverbs 4 said, wisdom is the principal thing. Everybody remember that? Wisdom is key in life. If I want to succeed, you want to succeed, then I need wisdom. That's what he said. He said, you get wisdom above everything else. Get wisdom. So I look at Proverbs, and he talks a lot about speech and words, right? Words. Okay, so mastery of the tongue is a sign of wisdom. The less one speaks, the fewer serious errors one will make. James talks about two types of wisdom, earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom. And he had this to say about the, both of these. Verse 15, this wisdom, 14, I'm sorry. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth, this wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, earthbound, sensual, and devilish. This wisdom. Basically, it benefits demonic spirits because they take advantage of our fallen nature. Then verse 16 says, for, for, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Now, we, we talked on a few Sundays about spirits. How spirits, they do not like exposure. Because when they are exposed, it's easy to cast them out. So they do not like exposure. They will even make people get mad because they realize that if that light shines, the light of God's truth shines in the area where they are controlling a, hope, a person, then their chances of remaining there, if that person is sincere, their chances of remaining there is slim. So they would rather fight so that that person can not receive the blessedness of deliverance. And so when Jesus came on the earth, he did so much deliverance, so much setting people free. And do you not know that the basis of God's love or the basis of God's healing, I should say, is his love. He knows what we have need of. He looked and saw humanity that would suffer and suffer and suffer and suffer until a redeemer would come. So he sent his son, Jesus, to redeem us from sin and from Satan's grip. The first step was salvation. My salvation is good, isn't that right? Man, just to know my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It means so much. And uh, so, but further is God delivering us from so many things that have come our way and brought about control and infestation, to say the least. So we talked about rebellious spirits and we talked about religious spirits. We talked about uh, spirits of infirmity, how they attack people's body. They go to, go to the doctors and the doctors can't do anything. 
because they can't see a spirit if there's, they're attacking that body. It's not, it's not going to show up on a microscope. They can't see it. But they can be discerned. Isn't that right? God, once God discerns it and shows a person, a man or woman of God or a believer, what's hiding there, and if they know their authority, they can cast it out, and the person will instantly begin to recover. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, is that good or what? You know, a lot. God is a good God, saints. God is good. The fact that he wants to heal us, body, soul, and spirit. I, you know, I, we, we can't do it in our own self, but God can. He loves. Christ died that we might live. There was a couple I was, I was hoping if they were here, I was going to have them to give a testimony. Some of the things they told me, what happened to them when they came to the altar a few Sundays ago. But they're not here today. But nobody laid hands on them. We all were just gathered at the altar. And one just got delivered from a spirit of rebellion. They said, I felt it just totally come out and lift. One got the spirit delivered from a spirit of abandonment. He said it just lifted off, off, totally off, just like something just was taken off of me. God is in the healing business, saints. And I'm only sharing with you this because wherever we need help from God, God does it. That's his delight. That's his joy. So I don't want to walk around with things that I'm carrying and maybe whether through ignorance or through pride, I want to be free. What about you? I want to be free because freedom feels a lot better than bondage. I'll tell you, hallelujah. Amen. So James had this to say. He was talking to the strangers that were scattered. And he said, don't many of you, he said, many of you, not many, there shouldn't be a lot of people uh, aspiring to be teachers because we will be judged more strictly than others because to whom much is given, much is required. Isn't that right? Yeah, so he, he, he warned them, don't, 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 every, don't many of you ascribe to be teachers. And then he goes on to talk about uh, the value of the tongue and keeping it under control and uh, wisdom is not a philosophical thing theory but something that has to be demonstrated in daily life wisdom is not a philosophical theory it's not a theory isn't that right but it's something that has to be demonstrated in daily life a person may say oh I got wisdom but that wisdom must be demonstrated in their daily life. Isn't that right? If a person said, I've got wisdom and they love to talk, they've just given themselves away. Isn't that right? Because the book of Proverbs tells us this. Okay. The earthly wisdom rests on lies and on the bad use of the tongue. It divides people. It sows hatred and jealousy. The heavenly wisdom brings about healthy human relationships and peace with others. If a person has wisdom, they are like counselors of peace. They tell someone, don't do it this way, brother, sister. Do it the right way and get God's results. Don't do according to what's coming to your mind in the heat of your anger because uh, if you don't let the dust settle and then so you can think clearer, you'll inevitably you'll say or do something wrong. Isn't that right? Wisdom. Wisdom dictates when we're upset and angry, we shouldn't say very much because the anger of men does not work the righteousness of God. So we learn. Now, as Christians, we learn that when we're angry, it's best to just sit there or go there and say nothing until the anger subsides. 
You see, you are protecting yourself against the onslaughts of evil. They would love to take a person that's very upset and frustrated and use their tongue. But God wants better for us. Much better. Because we're made in his image and likeness. All right. Now, the problem in the early church, I want to mention some of the things that's the problems in the early church. But beforehand, let me go to James 1, verse 26. He says, If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain, useless, doesn't, it's not worth very much. The Living Bible says, anyone who says he's a Christian but doesn't control his sharp tongue is just fooling himself and his religion isn't worth much. That's the Living Bible. I want you to think about that. I want you to really think about this. As sons of God, we must learn to control our tongues. It's not optional. It is very serious. How do you do that? How do you do that when it just seems like it's an itch that needs to be scratched. Well, let me tell you what the word shares with us. He says, verse 13, chapter 3, Who is a wise man and, and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conduct or lifestyle his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against truth. This wisdom descends not from above. So it is the heart. Somebody say heart. It is that which is in the heart that hinders wholesome, disciplined speech. It is in the heart. The Bible in one of the prophets says, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Then it says, who can know it? So how, what do we do? Here is the mirror for us. When we are examining our hearts, we look at the perfect law of freedom. It is the mirror, and so when we look at that mirror and we talk to God prayerfully and sincerely, then we will begin to see the areas where we need to comb our hair or we need to straighten up our necktie. All right. If I, if I came up here like that, then you would be, it's like, you know what? Can somebody get to him and tell him that his tie is crooked? I can be saying some real stuff. But they can't get beyond the man need to straighten his tie. Are y'all get what I'm saying? But if I happen to look in the mirror, I say, oh, this tie is crooked. Oh, my God. Same way when you look into the word of God. When you look into the word of God, searching for truth, searching for God's wisdom, searching for God's mind, then the Holy Spirit will begin to zero in on something that you need to pay attention to in your life. Are you hearing what I'm saying? <laughs> Hallelujah. But now here is a problem. If we don't look into the word of God, then we're dressing ourselves without understanding what we look like. Amen. Have you ever tried to dress apart from a mirror and you got almost everything together, but then there were some things that 
like I said, you, 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 your necktie wasn't straight because you were you didn't look in the mirror. It's the same way when we fail to look into the word of God, but for that inner man, are you with me? There's an inner man that needs dressing. And so the Lord, by his spirit, now the Holy Spirit has the job of helping us to discern on the inside what's going on. Isn't that right? And so then when we said, ah, Lord Jesus, I ask you to help me in that area of my life. And God so delightfully does. He just lo loves for us to ask his help. Because that's what he specializes in. Helping us. And so when we do that on a continual basis. Look what James said in chapter 1. He says. Verse 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and a doer, not a doer, he's likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholds himself and goes his way and straightway forget what manner of man he was. He forgot what he saw. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. Isn't that right? And then he goes on to be talking about uh, browning their tongue. So it, it is important for us as believers. One of the things that the Lord made clear to me is that He said, I'm coming real soon. I'm coming real soon. So we don't have the luxury of kind of playing church. We have to allow God to fix us. Isn't that right? My job as a pastor is allow him to fix me first and then to be an instrument for him to fix others right that's my task that's what he's given us so saints with all sincerity remember this God is soon to come and he is dealing with his church I mean he is dealing with his church if you, have you ever noticed that you're going through things more now than you've ever done before? And have you ever noticed that God allows things to happen that really just frustrate you? Yes, I mean, just frustrate you. It's like, God, what's, what's going on? God is at work. Getting his bride ready. Now, I'll share something with you a little bit later on what he shared with me. I hope you don't throw anything up here. But I'm, I'm trying to finish what I'm doing. <laughs> All right. So the problem in the early church look at chapter 4. We see that there were some heart problems in chapter 3, right? And there was not the wisdom, divine wisdom but look at chapter 4. There was fightings, quarrels. But the problem was, look at verse 4, chapter 4, 4. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore would be a friend of the world, the enemy of God. Now the Lord was sharing with me. He said, he said son, this, this is my problem. Now, I, I realize that, that that's not 100%. That's, so please, if you're not in that bunch, just bear with me. I'm trying to make a point. The Lord said, here's the problem. He said, my people are in love with the world. They're in love with the world. So James said the friendship of the world is an enmity with God. So this, this, was, this was the church in, 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 uh, this, this, among the strangers that were scattered. So he says, do you not know that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore would be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. 
Do you think that the scripture says in vain the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy? John, in, 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 in 1 John, he says, Love not the world, nor the things of the world. Now, you could have said, somebody could have said, well, John, I mean, what do you mean? We got to live in this world. So what? You can be in the world, but not of the world, right? You can be in the world and you can have your affections on things above, right? So he says, for all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, if God, since God is coming back soon, He's coming back for his bride that he's been preparing for a long time. And I just want you to image this. Men, how would you like to have a wife that's in love with somebody else? And you're getting ready to marry. Wouldn't do it, would you? Well, God is getting ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we are his bride. So what God has to do now is cause us to be in love with him. With him. I didn't ask for this big home. But he gave it to me. You got to hear what I'm saying. I didn't pray for that home. That was God's doing. I didn't pray for that car. God wanted me to have it. Now let me go take you back a little bit so you can understand some that probably don't know me. And the Lord told me to go full time years ago. And June 1980, I went full time. My family, Jessica wasn't born. Neither and Tricia were very small. So I went full time in obedience to him, talked with the pastor. And I went through several years of real serious, serious financial drought. But I could not erase one th thing. He called me full time. I couldn't get around it. I could have said, and I got to, almost to that point one time. I said, Lord, you know what? I'm, 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 I'm going right into an employment office. I'm going to get me a job because you ain't, you ain't coming through. I was right at that point. And then the Lord said to me, he said, son, if you will pray in the morning and a reasonable time at night, he said, God will bless you. So I took him at his word. The rest is history. But the point that I want to make is this. Just living out what he said. There's no one that leaves father, mother, wife, children, or whatever for my sake. But that I will give him a hundredfold in this life. That's what he said. So I didn't ask for those things, but he told me that. He said, I want to bless you. That's how that went. All right? But while I was going through, my parents, they were godly parents. They didn't understand. I couldn't tell them that I wasn't called. I knew I was called. And the only thing my dad had to say when I told him I was called he said, I got one thing to say to you. He said, live what you preach. That's all he said. He said, if you're going to be a preacher, then he said, live what you preach. So the point that I'm making is this year. The earlier part of the years was suffering to see if I was going to stay in love with him when it wasn't popular. My daughters will tell you. They grew up, and it was difficult at times. But I was determined, like Paul said, to find out why he called me full time. I don't care what happened. I said, I'm going to find out. I've got to know that, I, that God can be trusted. 
I don't care how many people tell me God can be trusted, but I need to know for myself. But I can tell you right now. You can trust him. You can trust him. You can put your trust in God. God will bless you. If he tell you to sacrifice something, go ahead and give it up. Don't be worried about what I'm going to do. Just believe God. God is faithful. That promised. Well, I can see it now. Come through the storm. Come through the wilderness. Come through the waters. Come through the flood. But the waters didn't overflow me. I came through the fire. But they didn't burn me up. God was faithful. Hallelujah. When they were persecuting me, persecuting my family, persecuting everything about me, in humiliations, embarrassment, they were a dime a dozen. Every time I turned around, I was being humiliated because I didn't have it. But let me tell you something. God said, son, stay the course. If you go through, I can bless you. And I'm telling you the same thing. If you go on through, God will bless you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. God will not be made a liar. If he promised you something, you can bank on it. It, it may not come in your time, but if he spoke it, it'll come to pass. Hallelujah. But you know what James said in the Bible? He said, don't, don't be a lover of the world. He said, we're pilgrims and strangers. God needs people in his program. God needs people to do his will. God wants people that whose minds and hearts are fixed. They want to do the will of God. They, they understand that they're only here for an appointed time. God needs the strangers and the sojourners here in this world. That's what God's looking for. He's not looking for somebody that's ready to rub shoulders with the world. God said, dare to trust me. I want to work the miracles. I'm still in the miracle working business. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> I tell you, I told you what I said to the Lord years ago when I felt so. I was reading the Bible about Daniel. God, I said, that's what I want. Daniel and the lion then. I said, man, that's what I want, that kind of faith. And just as gently the Holy Spirit said, then I need someone that's willing to be in the lion's den. I thought, okay, scratch that, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God needs people that going to trust him. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. And let me say this here. By the Spirit, right in your situation, if you would dare trust God, he'll work a miracle for you. If you dare trust him. Don't look at the situation and just be so frustrated. Look at God. God want to work a miracle. You said you wanted to see his power, isn't that right? Come on, y'all. He can do it. He can do it. Yeah, I remember my, my old man was praying, God, increase my faith. I want to get closer to you. So he had a new truck he just bought. And my sister went out and wrecked it. He was crazy about that truck. Boy, she was scared to come back home. Because she knew how much he loved that truck. And the Lord had to speak to him. And God told him, he said, if you don't address this situation right, you can destroy her. So dad had to get it together and put that little idol aside and consider God's will. So when she came, she was scared to death. She said, dad, I, I wrecked the truck. He said, God already told me. He said, I can get another truck. 
but I can't get another daughter like that. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And look at somebody say the will of God. You see, we're sojourners and strangers here on this earth. And God wants to give assignments, all right, to his people. But the problem with the early church, they was in love with the world. And they would literally boast and say things. Okay, I'm going down to Florida here, and, 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 and maybe next year, and I'm going to spend a year down there, and I'm, I'm going to uh, you know, start a business down there. And after that, you know, I'm, God going to you know, bless me. He ain't said, Lord, will, ain't said nothing. Just that's how they talked. James says, you, you, you can't do it that way. He said, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, I will do thus and so. He said, now what are you doing? You're talking, is boasting. You're boasting. I'm going down to Florida. I'm going, I'm going to do this year, next year, and that's what I'm doing. He said, you're boasting. You don't, may not even be living, isn't that right? But he was trying to give them wisdom, wisdom, because we belong to the Lord. Can I say it again? We belong to the Lord. And so God must be able to do with us whatever he wants to do. And he must not get any flat. All right. Y'all see what I'm saying? God is talking. When I was looking at that word, I said, now, Lord, now, you told me to do this, but that word sounds like it's, that, that ain't, that ain't like what, I, what we need to be talking about. So after I got on my knees and the Lord says, God knows what he's doing. I said, okay, all right. Okay, I'm done. Even when I was sitting in the chair, I was talking to him again, now, Lord. Saints, you will be the better for it. If God can get us to understand the value of controlling our speech, he will have accomplished something very great in our lives. He can do the hard part, the, but uh, he can do the uh, easy part for him, but the hard part for God is this, to get us to control our speech. Because we have a free will. Oh, you hear what I'm saying? We have a free will. If we decide I'm not going to do it, then there's nothing God can do. He has to rely on our will, our yielding our will to God. And so uh, I, I, I hope that this point is coming across clear. God is serious about the times that we're living in now. And people need to see God more than anything else right now. And... All right, then also there was unsettledness among them. To be unsettled is to be lacking in stability or aimless, indecisive, not having a real purpose. So he kind of checked me with that point, unsettled. It was like, I want you to pay attention to this. And when people are unsettled, they need a sense of purpose. Oh, you hear me? When you and I, when we have a sense of purpose, that purpose will drive us. It'll keep us on focus. Are you with me? Some of you are saying, amen, but you don't quite know what I'm saying. But the point that I'm making is this year. Every vision has purpose, and it'll, it has energies of its own. And there are many of us, not only here on the TV, but here among us, that needs a sense of direction. And with that sense of direction, the, it will provide its own energy. We have a greater purpose than just coming together and worshiping. Our purpose is much, much greater than that. God filled us with his Holy Spirit. Think about it. Follow with me now. Does he really need to just fill us with the Holy Spirit just to come and worship? Think about it. There are souls that are dying. There are people in the clutches of sin and Satan that whose, his power must be broken off of their lives. God has no one other than his people to have that love and that concern 
to say, God, use me for your glory. Use me for your honor. And he will make a way. Jesus looked on the harvest field. He saw when he was here nothing but just ripe, ripe harvest. And he says the harvest is plenteous. But the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he'll send forth laborers into his harvest. How many are willing to be a laborer for God? How many are willing to be used of God, to go where he wants you to go, to, to do what he wants you to do, to say what he wants you to say? That's what God is looking for. He's a good savior. I tell you, somebody got to me, and because of that, I'm saved today. And I, you know, I'm ever grateful. And I know many of you feel the same way. People, somebody took the time and shared Christ, and you're saved today. Now, the other point that I made that, that God showed me here in verse 16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Now, you want you to see why God is, is dealing with envy, okay? Envy is one of the things that God said I want to deal with at this time. He said to me, there's envy. And envy can be destructive. And so I use that scripture because God gave me that scripture to me. I said, God, what's a good scripture? He gave me Jane. So envy has to do with a feeling of discontented or resentful longing aroused by someone else's possession, qualities, or luck, desiring what belongs to someone else. Envy. And he said if there's envy and selfish ambitions... Don't boast. This is not the wisdom that comes from God. This wisdom is earthbound. It benefits demonic powers. So now, when God is ministering to his church, get this now, in order for God to cause his church to go forward like he's planning, these spiritual forces that are using our weakness and our hurts and fears, they must be cast out and we must be healed. Otherwise, we can stand in the way of what God wants to do. Are you hear what I'm saying? God says there's envy and I want to heal people from envy and jealousy. Envy can arise from a lot of different, as a result of a lot of situations. A person can envy someone's family if they have a nice family. A person can envy somebody if they have a good job and they don't. A person can envy somebody if they're used mightily of God and they're not. A person can envy for so many reasons. Envy. But envy is destructive. And God says this thing must be dealt with Envy. First, he talks about rebellion so that he can get us to submit to him. Because if spirits of rebellion have their way, we would never submit to God. There would always be excuses. Well, I'm not ready. But God says, I got work to be done. I got works to be done. All right. So they were unsettled. There was a lack of stability there. James said, uh, in, in, uh, um, it says, wherever there is jealousy or selfish ambitions, there will be disorder and every other kind of evil. So what is in the heart, God has to deal with. The heart will determine the speech content and the attitude. It's the intent of the heart. Someone, you know, I deal with, God has me dealing with heart matters all the time. That's just how he uses me, heart matters. And one person was talking to God and said, God, why, why is he always? God says, that's apostolic. Look at what happened in the, in the Bible. The apostles, they dealt with heart matters. James. Who's a wise man among you? 
Peter, Jesus, John, Paul, they dealt with heart matters because they knew by the Holy Ghost that God looks on the heart. Isn't that right? God don't look on our exterior. He ain't thinking about that. He looks on the inner man. And so that word is to challenge us. And so, uh, you know, it's easy to preach this. But that goes to me too. That same word goes to me. I look at it before I give it to you. Isn't that right? Hey, look, I'm not fooling myself up here. I understand that it's God's grace and God's mercy. But it does not negate the fact that God wants to heal us from envy and jealousy. We must not envy anybody, no matter what they're going through. I passed through it. I remember going through it years ago. I've told that before. There was a young man saying a whole lot better than I did, and he was smooth. And when he first came on the scene and everything, I was like, I want him to go away, you know. <laughs> Can I be real? But when that thing showed up, I said, oh, no, this is not nice. I went home, and I cried out to God. I said, Lord, this is not going to happen to me. And I stayed right there until the Lord took it away. Sure did. When I got up, I was done. When I got ready, I was ready to sing all you want to. I'm all right. Because God healed me of envy. I'm not telling you stuff that I've, I've, I've been through a lot of this stuff that I'm talking to you. It's real. But I saw the hand of God. He can do it, saints. I told you about a time somebody did something to me and it was a superior. And I felt really bad. I was so hurt. I was going home, me and my wife. I said, baby, I don't know. I, I, I really can't figure out why this happened. I said, but I'm going to forgive them. I'll never forget that as long as they live. And as soon as I said that, took it right out of my heart. I was like, oh, my God. Saints, God can set you free. But you got to want to be free. You look at somebody and say, you can't play with it now. You got to be real for God. And God will set you free. I, I wish I could get this. God can set you free. Ain't nothing God can't do. And he wants to. He wants to. So just keep yourself open before God. And if he brings up an area, then say, God, go there. I give you permission. You just go there until you fix that area of my life. And he so gracefully, he'll fix it. And you move you on to another area. Say, now, now let's fix this one here, all right? <laughs> Amen. But he's getting us ready. He's such a good God. All right. So they were worldly minded. They were not submitted to God. Look at verse 7. Verse 7 in chapter 4. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Some were not submitted to God. Not all of them, but some were not submitted to God. So God is looking for us to submit to him, right? Then he says, resist the devil. That means the devil was oppressing are you with me? Now, and he'll flee from you. So we, uh, and, and here's, let me go to what, what the Lord uh, concluded and what God said he wants to do. First, he said, in a great house, Paul told Timothy. I better read that. Second Timothy chapter 2. He said, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified in meat for the master's use, and prepared to every good work. Isn't that good? So he said, if a man purge himself from these, All right, now I'm, I'm, I'm winding down to the last. This is what I feel like the Lord shared also. He says, some do not know how to take advantage of the love that God has for us. Some just don't know what to do. They don't know how to receive the love that God has 
already ordained. And so I said, Lord, what do we tell them? What do we tell us if we're not receiving sufficiently? Some, some are. Some are. Some are really, really, you know who you are. You're doing your, your, your own target for God and, you know, God is blessing you. But not everybody is. Some are still struggling. So God said, number one, draw near to him. Draw near to God. And then God will draw near to you. That's how it goes. Get a little closer to God. Again, it may not be for everybody, but for the ones that uh, this word is ministering to, I want you to see what he's saying. Draw closer to God. God wants to bring you closer. Maybe you need to spend more time in prayer. Maybe you need to spend more time in God's word. Maybe you're slack as far as fellowshipping with the saints. I don't know what it is, but he said draw near. And there are different ways you can draw near. If you want to get to know him, look into his word, right? And then if you want to get to know and more intimate with God, then talk to God in prayer. Take time for God in prayer. Take time. He longs for us. He loves us so much. He want to fellowship with us. He want to talk to you about the problem that you're going through. He want to tell you that I'm able to help you in this area. So let's see God now. So first draw near. He said draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Then he said he want to give understanding. He said it is not God that's oppressing us. He said, it's Satan. And he says, we have to be aware. It's Satan. It's not God. So the understanding is, understanding Satan and his organized hosts. He goes about as a roaring lion. He just want to devour somebody. He just want to catch somebody off guard. He's, and he's busy at what he does. And he's good at what he does. So the Lord says, it's not me. It's, I'm not doing that to people. I want the people to understand. So which the third thing is this year, he want, I want people to begin to come into more spiritual growth. With the growth comes responsibilities. It comes spiritual warfare, learning about spiritual warfare, learning about discerning and discerning what's good and what's evil and, and, and seeing the prayers answered. It's, it's about interceding for others. Spiritual gifts begin to flow and the power gifts and things of this nature. God says it's like growth. I want my people to grow more so I can use them more. I want to impart gifts of the spirit to many. All of the whole church should have gifts of the spirit, not just a handful. The whole church must, should have spiritual gifts. And as we're maturing and can allow, allow God to, then we can be used of God. God is using people, but he wants to increase this thing like, like you've never seen before. So he said, draw near, and then he said, understanding uh, that we're in a kingdom, and that a light, and that kingdom is, uh, is against this kingdom of darkness. And then the third thing he said, spiritual growth. Growing spiritually. Growing spiritually. And then being able to bear fruit. Fruits of praise, fruits of thanksgiving, and fruits of love, and humility, and joy. He wants us to, to walk in this love. This, this thing about love, by this shall all men know your mind, right? Walking in love. So this, this is, we're talking spiritual growth. And then he says renewal, not renewal, the knowledge of, uh, of God. And he said be transformed by, by renewing of the mind, right? And then he said, the, it'll, all these things, it'll just, the blessings will spill over to the natural and the spiritual. So we want to grow in God, draw close to God. Somebody says, well, I'm doing all I know to do from God. Well, then he may not be talking to you. Isn't that right? But there is somebody he's talking to. Isn't that right? <laughs> Amen. So he wants us to grow. And uh, then he says, uh, remember the background. The background plays an important part. To how easy or difficult it may be for us to overcome certain things, the background. We may be thinking different and thinking wrong. And then he said, become a good listener and practice what you hear and receive. Be teachable. Isn't that right? Be teachable. He said, become a good listener and practice what you hear and receive. Be a good listener. All right. I'm going to close with this 
these, uh, what the scripture says about, um, as some of you are looking, you want to know, you're concerned about your future. God knows. But get this in conclusion. Proverbs 4.30 says, uh, this is not the King James. It says, a relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. But envy or jealousy rots it away. The King James has a sound heart or is health to the body, is the life of the flesh. A sound heart, a heart that doesn't have envy and jealousy and anger and all of these things. Sooner or later, those vices in the heart will cause pain and suffering. And it'll cause a person's health to begin to deteriorate. So God want to preserve us from such a thing. He's that kind of a friend. Proverbs 27, 4. Jealousy is more dangerous and cruel than anger. Jealousy is more dangerous and cruel than anger. Matthew 27 says, uh, talks about Jesus being delivered to the, uh, they delivered Jesus to the hands of Pilate. But they delivered him because of envy. Envy can be destructive. So we don't want to play around with that in jealousy. The patriots, Joseph's brethren, moved with envy. And they sold Joseph into envy. But thank God, God was with him. Envy is dangerous. You don't want to play around it. You want to, if you find that God, there's envy in your heart, you want to be honest. Say, God, get this thing out of me. I don't want to be that way. Acts 13, 44 and 45, where um, there were those that spoke against Paul's teaching. They were contradicted and blaspheming because of envy. And the list goes on. And so the writer here, James, says, where there's envy and strife or selfish ambition, the wisdom of God cannot flow but it corrupts and it benefits demonic powers and those powers will do everything they can to stop the progress of any spiritual church. But thanks be to God. Thanks be to God that he will preempt every attempt of evil for he's bigger than life. Hallelujah. He's bigger than life. But we have to expose the envy so that people can get free. You don't know what it feels like if you haven't been freed from something like that. It sure feels good. I mean, it feels good. If you haven't been freed from anger, haven't been freed from unforgiveness, you don't know what you're missing. Oh, my God. You haven't begun to live if those vices are in the soul. But when God heals and sets your soul free, hallelujah, then you can say like David, so why are you cast down? Hope in God. Hallelujah, who is the health of our countenance and our God. Um, as the heart pants for the water brook, so panted my soul after you, God. Um, there's a longing and a stirring in the hearts of God's people that want God. Uh, you ought to want God. Uh, we ought to want God with everything that's in us. Um, hallelujah, because there's nothing in this world to even compare to God. God and all the things in this world they pale into insignificance when you get a glimpse of the goodness of God God is good and he wants to rain on us he wants to flow in and through us he wants to cleanse us he wants to sanctify us he wants to purge us oh so that hands will flow lift up toward God and the mouth and the heart will speak and glorify God with a pure heart. God loves you and I and he can do it. He specializes in that which is impossible to man so you don't have to feel bad and down and discouraged because if you have found yourself with envy then notice then God shine, shine the light so that you can be free. 
That's the reason that he would shine the light so that you can be free. But that's, look at someone, that's up to you. God wants to free us up. I do not want to go home with jealousy and envy. Nothing in this world matters more than pleasing God. We are born into the kingdom for such a time as this. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for each one of us that are here. I thank you because you're good. You've been so faithful. You've been so marvelous. And just like you delivered from abandonment and fear and all of these things, it is such an easy thing for you. And we are here today asking you now for the release of your power to heal us, Lord, and fix us and make us right in your sight. Oh, God, we thank you because you love us, Lord. We thank you because it's a delight for you. It's not a chore. It's a delight for you to do it. And we are grateful, Lord God. And although, Lord God, you, when you look on us, Lord, as sons of God, you see the blood of your son, you still want to sanctify us um, so that we Lord God can get the best out of this life God and the kingdom of our God so we'll lift our hands and we're going to praise you for it Lord and we're going to thank you Lord God because you love us so much God um, you care for us God um, you care for us more than we can care for our own selves make us whole now and we'll give your name the praise I want you to stand with me now